We're filming today for the Hamilton College Jazz Archive, and it's our great pleasure to have with us Bill Crow, who has multiple careers in music, <laughs> and um, as a bass player, yeah. and a writer, and uh, working with the Musicians Union, which yeah. is a kind of a first for us to be talking in that <laughs> area. So it'll be interesting to hear about how that work is going. Yeah. Um, welcome, and uh, I'd love to talk about some of your writing. First of all, were you, uh, can I guess that you were a player before you were a writer? Yeah, well, um, uh, I, I've always been interested in writing. Uh, I was a big reader when I was a kid. I learned to read before I started grade school. My mother had a little primer and she taught me at home. Mm -hmm. Uh, she also taught me to sing, and uh, I guess I inherited my musical ears from her. She was a musician. But I can remember standing by her ironing board singing songs with her before I could uh -huh. see up over the ironing uh -huh. board, so I know it was pretty young. And she tells me that uh, when I still used to take naps in the afternoon in my little crib in the bedroom, uh, when she would be teaching a, a singing student, uh, she would sing the exercise she wanted them to sing, and then the student would sing it, and then they'd have to pause for me to sing it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, but she got me started reading, and I was an omnivorous reader. Uh, I think while I was still in grade school in this small town outside Seattle, Washington, Kirkland, Washington is where I grew up, uh, there was a small library operated by the ladies club and the building is still there by mm -hmm. the way i was out there this this summer and saw that it's now a national landmark but they had accumulated a nice little library of books for a small town in the in the 20s there in the 30s and um before i was out of the fifth grade i'd read everything in that wow in that uh, library in fact when i got into greek mythology i had to get a note from my mother they wanted to make sure i wasn't pressing flowers in these big books or something but i read <laughs> everything in the library it was fantastic i would take three four books home a week and plow through them you know and um so by the time i was in uh, uh in school i was always interested in english and composition and the the teachers of those things saw me as a a prize student, yeah. and so they fed me stuff. I was, uh, I think it was a sixth grade teacher that gave me copies of the New Yorker, which I'd never seen before, and I fell in love with James Thurber mm -hmm. and E.B. White and Alexander Wolcott and became quite a sophisticate for the small town uh -huh. that we were in there. Some of the terms I didn't understand at all. I had to go find out what they were talking about, but, but uh, that was my beginning of appreciation of really good writing, and I think E.B. White became my my hero because he was such a master of the simple declarative sentence. He said what it was that he had on his mind without uh, uh, any question about what it was, mm -hmm. and he had a good sense of humor, and he was interested in things. Uh, Joseph Mitchell was another of my great heroes. He wrote uh, articles about New York for the, for the New Yorker, and his, his stuff is now collected in a, in a wonderful book. but. Uh, Unfortunately, he hasn't written anything. He's still around, but he yeah. hasn't written anything for quite a while. Did this influence you mm -hmm. eventually coming to New York? Well, when I came to New York, it was on the suggestion. You know, I'd been in the Army for a while, uh -huh. and I had been out here on a visit once just out of high school. But the idea of ever leaving Kirkland, Washington was uh, not a strong possibility. Uh, in the, you know, we were Depression kids, and... Uh, just the idea that anybody would go anywhere else in the first mm. place you didn't think you could afford it yeah you might go to Seattle but uh, that's that's about the the limit of our scope at that time and the idea that anybody would become a professional musician was not uh, within our realm of possibility because we didn't know any we knew some music teachers uh -huh. uh, and we knew lots of amateur musicians everybody was a musician in those days it was a social uh, well, Sing. yeah, at that, you know, in the 20s and 30s, uh, everybody at least sang. Uh, I, I, I remember singing almost everywhere I went. If we went to church, we sang. If we went to an American Legion meeting, we sang. If we went to somebody's house, within uh, a half hour after dinner, we would be around the piano singing the songs everybody knew, you know, Stephen Foster yeah. songs, uh -huh. World War I songs, stuff like that. And everybody sang. There was no such thing as somebody without a voice. There were people that it was understood they didn't have strong voices mm -hmm. or that they sang a little sharp or the quality of their voice was a little raspy. But um, 
that that didn't make pariahs of them. Everybody was expected to try, uh -huh. and the strong singers carried it. You know? Wow. So uh, we've come to an age now where we, we lean on professionals tremendously. Yeah. Uh, we become uh, watchers instead of participants, and I think it's kind of unfortunate because there was um, there was a quality of uh, of sharing that musical experience in in the community singing and the the school bands and that whole thing that was a uh, uh, I think the the swing era that that kind of playing that went on in the big bands was a direct outgrowth of that it was uh, the whole thrill of playing well together in a big band is uh, is becoming really skilled at getting together like mm -hmm. that. You know, everybody appreciated barbershop harmony and that sort of thing. And when you got into a big band and could play riffs together or could read dumb stock together and yeah. really make it into yeah. some music, that was a thrilling achievement. <laughs> Do you think that change is partly because of the entertainment that's available at oh, every, sure. every sure. place you go? Sure. You know? I mean, I saw it happen when, when I was a kid. My mother used to take the ferry to Seattle and ride the streetcar up over the hill down to you know, where the radio station was. And on the local Seattle radio station, she would sing songs or play the organ and make $5 for the program, something like that. But I mean, that was a big income in those mm -hmm. days, uh, supplementing uh, what my dad was making. Everybody was out of work and he was scuffling. And uh, $5 really made the difference between whether we had meat on mm -hmm. the table or not sometimes. And uh, when the when the Seattle radio station joined the uh, the network and all the programs started coming out of Chicago, those jobs yeah, vanished. Yeah. The only she continued to to play on the radio, but it was for free on church programs. Oh, and uh, so then her her extra income came from playing at funerals uh -huh. and weddings and yeah. things like that. You know, but I, uh, she had also participated in a a previous automation where. Uh, she, when she was a young girl, she played the piano for the silent movies uh, down in Arizona where she lived. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, when uh, sound came in, that wiped out all those little piano players and also all the pit orchestras in the big cities yeah. that used to play for the movies. Yeah. So. so when did the bass come into uh, the picture here? Well, it's funny. I was a brass player all the time I was a kid. I wanted to be. My mother started me on piano, and I hit a wall about uh, the John M. Williams second book, I think. <laughs> I couldn't get both hands to pay attention to what they were doing. <laughs> but in the fourth grade, a wonderful man came to our school, uh, Al Benest was his name, and took over the whole music system from high school to grade school. He saw that he didn't have much to work with because the previous person had been kind of perfunctory, and mm -hmm. his whole band was graduating that year and nothing was coming up, you know. So I was in the fourth grade, he came down and passed out sheets of paper and said, who wants to play what instrument and I'll talk to your folks. Yeah. So I knew what a trumpet was and I thought that was probably a nice instrument. And uh, so I wrote down trumpet and he came and talked to my mom and dad and they agreed that they would get me one. Now they were poor as church mice at the time, but there was a trumpet in the Sears Roebuck catalog for nine ninety five with case. <laughs> And that's what they got me. <clears throat> I had to wait a week to get it. The, the shipping of it yeah. was kind of slow. So I went to the band rehearsals every morning with the other kids, and I'd sit there and watch them fingering. Mm -hmm. And then when I finally got my horn, I was playing more, you know, watching their fingering. By so, sight. <laughs> but I had great ears, and I, I would learn the music within a day or two. If we played mm -hmm. it twice, I had it, you yeah. know. So I didn't get to be a good reader right away. I was a good listener and a yeah. kind of a sad reader. But by the time I was in the sixth grade, I was disappointed that I couldn't play the melodies. I couldn't, couldn't get enough lip to play the high notes so they wouldn't put me on first. Mm -hmm. And I complained to the teacher and he said, well, let me see your teeth, you know. And he said, you may never really get a good trumpet embouchure with mm -hmm. those front teeth. I got a, a pair of front teeth that stick out a little bit. Uh -huh. But he said, uh, the school owns a baritone horn. It has a bigger mouthpiece. Music reads just the same as a trumpet and has all the good parts, he yeah. tells me. Which is true when they transcribe from the uh, orchestra to the concert band. Mm -hmm. They take all the cello parts and give them to the baritone horn. So, uh, and the clincher was he told me he had played that instrument at one mm -hmm. time. I knew he was a trombone player. But, so, and I was crazy about him, so I said, all right, I'll try it. So, um, 
by this time, I think my dad had, had gotten me a $40 trumpet that was made out of silver instead yeah. of brass, and hoping that that would help me out. And uh, it didn't. So when I got the school horn, he took the horn back and got his money back. <laughs> and I was out of the trumpet business. Well, it turned out that the baritone horn was a beautiful instrument. I loved it, and I learned to play it well. And by the time I was in high school, I got an after-school job and bought a horn of my own that was really a good-sounding good instrument. And I would win solo contests. Mm -hmm. And you know, I was considered a, a, an exceptional baritone horn player. When I got into college, they were full of, uh, I, I went to the University of Washington for a little while before I went in the Army. And so they, they had all of the baritone chairs were full. I couldn't no. be a baritone horn player there. <laughs> I was crushed. But they offered me an E-flat tuba, which I tried to do. You're getting on. lower and lower so as you go on. So <laughs> I played that a little bit, didn't really like it and didn't have an opportunity to get into any music on it. The, the stuff we were playing, parts weren't very interesting. Um, and by this time, I'd become interested in jazz. And in high school, uh, uh, this same teacher had formed a little swing band that played stocks and was trying to teach us how that idiom went. So I bring my baritone horn to rehearsal and say, where are the baritone horn parts? Uh -huh. And again, I was crushed to discover that they didn't write for that instrument. <laughs> So I fooled around the last uh, year of high school. Uh, I tried saxophone for a while because my older brother had an old Bush or alto that he had left behind mm -hmm. when he went in the Navy. And uh, I never got a good sound on that. And when some better, I guess I started that in my junior year, when some better saxophones came into the band, I was aced out immediately. Yeah. But the drummer had graduated. so. I ran over to the service station where he worked and said, show me that thing you play on the hi-hat and how do you do this and, you know, what, what are the basic things you uh -huh. need to know about drumming. I could hear what the drummers had been doing. And I did that well enough. I, I was a fairly decent drummer because I could keep time. But when it got into really uh, being a jazz drummer later on, I had trouble with uh, uh, I wanted everything to be symmetrical and, and jazz players have to be able to keep uh, the time going with one hand while they do other things yeah. with their other hands. And I always wanted to do things that were symmetrical, and I couldn't get the asymmetrical things to, to work right for me. So I eventually gave up drums just by default. But I played them uh, all through high school and uh, in college a little bit. And when I got in the Army, all the drummers in the band I finally got into as a baritone player uh, were street drummers. Mm -hmm. So when we would have club dates and service club jobs for dancing, I would be the trap drummer. And uh, I met a um, cornet player from Brookline, Massachusetts in, uh, in, uh, in the Army who was a, a real moldy fig in those days. He loved everything from Louis Armstrong up to about Muggsy Spanier. And, a moldy uh, fig. <laughs> I haven't heard that term in a while. That was an old yeah. term, yeah. The figs and the boppers right. in those days. <laughs> but at that time, I had never heard of bebop. Uh -huh. I, I had a pretty good jazz collection. I collected everything from, oh, Duke Ellington. Uh, of course, the, the big bands that were popular in those days, I collected jazz just because it was pop music. I was collecting Benny Goodman, Harry James, Tommy Dorsey, Glenn Miller, all that stuff. But by some wonderful fluke, uh, this little electric store that sold uh, stoves and refrigerators in Kirkland, Washington, all, had a little corner in the back with a stack of 78s, oh. and their distributor, for some reason, was sending them these little tiny labels from New York, like Moash and Signature and Guild and labels like that. So I all of a sudden started hearing musicians like Don Bias and Eddie Miller and. Um, Mary Lou Williams and uh, Bill Coleman and uh, uh, small group jazz that I'd never heard much before except on Benny Goodman records. So uh, I was very interested in that. And then I, I found out about Edmund Hall and uh, some of the more traditional players just through these records that right. were there. They were all mixed together. I had mm -hmm. no idea about styles or periods or right. anything like that. It was just all good jazz to me. So, and somehow I missed Count Basie completely. That was, he wasn't among mm -hmm. those records. Wasn't know? in the pile, that's all. So when I got out into the Army, um, first I, I came under the influence of this moldy fig who taught me that whole repertoire, which has stood me in great good stead as a, as a professional musician, because I know all of the Armstrong stuff, the traditional Chicago jazz 
mm -hmm. tunes. And uh, uh, then another guy came in from Maslin, Ohio, who was a bebopper. And he, we said, well, you know, what, what's bebop? We don't know. And he said, well, there's a record, there's a station out of Chicago late at night we can probably get. We were stationed in Baltimore at that time. So we would stay up at night and get the Dave Garraway show. And Dave was a disc jockey at that time in Chicago who liked Sarah Vaughan and George Treadwell's arrangements and Charlie Parker and uh, m the more melodic mm -hmm. stuff. He didn't really go into the outside music. But that was my first taste and it sounded wonderful to me. I'd, I'd been living, uh, I'd been listening to uh, classical composers that used that kind of harmony anyway, Ravel and Debussy. Mm -hmm. and and Mahler. So uh, uh, it would just seem like a natural addition to, uh, to what I was already listening to, but my moldy fig friend was outraged and said, <laughs> you can't like that music, you know? <laughs> I said, well, how do I stop yeah, myself? Right. So I didn't see why I couldn't play both kinds, and I uh -huh. have so, to this day. So, you said something almost in passing that I wonder if you could elaborate on. You said jazz was pop music. Yeah. You know, and, and we sometimes forget. There was a there was a a Seberg uh, a jukebox in the in the soda fountain in Kirkland, Washington, where I used to go get my after school sodas that had twelve selections on it, twelve seventy eight records, and out of those twelve, I would say six were hip records. There were there would be one or two Duke Ellington tunes. There'd always be a Benny Goodman tune, mm -hmm. a Glenn Miller, a couple of Tommy Dorseys. Then you would also have Kay Kaiser and you know, some of the novelty bands and some of the sweet bands, Sammy Kay, something mm -hmm. like that. But I go into a jukebox place now where they've got 400 to 1,000 choices <laughs> and there's not one thing I want to listen yeah. to. It's just unreal. Yeah. But it, you know, the wheel turns. It just happened that what was being made popular by the new media at that time, records and radio, uh, included jazz. They needed product. They needed anything mm. to put on the air at that time. Radio were, was a really big part of spreading this oh, music. Oh yeah, and radio. Uh, I mean, there weren't there weren't the number of people producing stuff for radio, and advertisers didn't understand how valuable radio was. Musicians didn't understand how valuable the ad advertising of having a record was. There were early musicians that wouldn't record because they were afraid people would steal oh, their music. Yeah. So the first people who recorded became insanely popular. It was wasn't that the story with with Freddie Keppard? And, yeah, and he passed yeah. up the chance to be yeah. the first Wouldn't Dixieland record. group. Yeah, but uh, as soon as people began to realize that, then uh, to get a, a record was important uh, if you if you wanted to be a popular band, and to get a job in a club that had a radio wire at night was important. That was one of the big things that built the bands at the Hickory House. I used to work there with Marion McPartland, but, but be, in the years before that, when they were first starting out, at night, uh, they didn't have a whole lot of sponsored programs, so the, all the radio stations would put telephone wires into the local nightclubs and ballrooms, and they would send a guy out to do a half-hour remote. Now, Birdland became very, very nationally known just because they had a radio wire, and every mm -hmm. Tuesday night when the new act would come in, the first set was broadcast on the radio. Everybody turned on and say, hey, that sounds good. They'd go down and hear the music. But not only that, people out of town would get these programs. And when they came to New York, they had an address that they knew and a place mm -hmm. to go. You know, made all the difference in the world. Wow. It was wonderful. So when did you arrive in New York? Well, when I got out Officially. of the Army, I, mean, I was here for like a three-day pass in the Army yeah. and a quick visit once before out of high school. but. Um, I went back to Seattle and, and re-entered the University of Washington, and this time, instead of living at home, I moved into, uh, to be closer to the campus. Uh, a friend had a houseboat on Lake Union that was full of musicians, and I lived there. And um, I met a drummer there who had been out on the road with bands, and he came from Olympia, Washington, but he'd been living in New York, and he knew the scene. And we became friends. and. Um, I played with a band he put together there in Seattle for a couple of months. But then uh, he was going with a girl piano player that had come through and gotten stranded in, in uh, Seattle, uh, an all-girl band. <laughs> and uh, first he got a job so that she could work with him uh, there, and that was where I was playing with him. But then she decided that she was ready to go home, so he decided he was ready to go to New York to be with her. and. Uh, uh, 
uh, he was talking to me one night and he says, you know, man, if you want to be a musician, you've got to go to where the music is. You know, that's yeah. the only way you're going to learn it. And that's the only way you're going to get into it. So why don't you come to New York with me? And uh, sounded reasonable to me. So I think we had our bus tickets in about 50 bucks, something like that. We got on the Greyhound and came out here. And that was uh, January of 1950. And uh, uh, um, I, I guess I, well, I ran out of my $50 pretty fast. And uh, I had picked up the printing trade a little bit while I was in high school. And I hadn't done it since I'd been in the Army, but uh, I remembered enough of it to go downtown and apply for a job feeding hand press. And uh, I think the first agency I went to, uh, 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 they asked me enough questions that reminded me enough of what the terms were that I was able to go to the second one and sound like a professional. Uh -huh. And they got me a job up in the Bronx at a horrible little print shop that people screamed at each other constantly. And I, I kind of liked that work, but I was used to people being nice. I had learned it in, in a small town uh -huh. where the printers were all genial and humorous. And these people were just like, ah! You know? mm. So, uh, 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 but they were paying me $30 a week. And out of that $30, I was splitting a room with a drummer on 83rd Street, 86th Street, in the 80s there someplace, uh, taking a weekly lesson with Lenny Tristano out in Flushing uh, on the valve trombone. Mm -hmm. I had switched to valve trombone to get more into jazz. And uh, I was seeing a therapist. I, I was interested in, in uh, the writings of Wilhelm Reich in those uh -huh. days. And uh, the, the thing to do was to go get yourself straightened out by an I'll organ therapist. Uh -huh. So and I, I've, actually, the therapist I found was quite uh, sympathetic. And uh, uh, he got me, uh, I didn't even know why I was there. I couldn't give him a particularly good reason, you know. But uh, uh, he got me into a different place. I had always been a, a very nice boy who tried to please everyone and, and, and felt a lot very anxious because some people I couldn't seem to please. You know? And uh, he got me to thinking about what did I like and what did I want to do with myself and who was I and all of that. Uh, these are not questions that I'd ever addressed. Mm -hmm. So I got to a point with him where I couldn't stand my, my day job and decided that I couldn't go there anymore. It was just uh, emotionally too shattering to go into that, that atmosphere every day. So without my day job, uh, then I fell behind on my payments to my therapist, and he suggested that I go out and get another job and live my life, and maybe I could afford to, to talk to a therapist sometime in the future. So, so I did. I, I, I scuffled around New York. And actually, I was very lucky to have fallen in with Dave Lambert and his wife and four-year-old daughter. They were living down in uh, the Lower East Side on a part of um, Monroe Street that's no longer there now. They built a project across uh -huh. that section of the block. But uh, they had a $20 a month apartment, and they were happy as clams, and they had no income. And uh, so they taught me how to survive. You know, that it doesn't make you a bad person to be poor. Mm -hmm and that it's possible to, uh, to still live and be productive and, and live you know, kind of hand to mouth. It wasn't that he had no income, it's just that he didn't know where the next dollar was going to come from. And, uh, but he was a willing worker and he had a wonderful attitude toward giving people value for service. And if you couldn't, you know, if, somebody, if you had to prevail on somebody to give you a handout, at least you could entertain them. So he was always uh, a very welcome. Uh, at parties, and yeah. uh, uh, he knew a few songwriters who were willing to give us a meal, that kind of thing. You mm -hmm. know? And, uh, so um, uh, I really got my New York uh, education from Davy. He showed me how to scuffle, and he showed me who the interesting people were, whether they were making any money or not. He knew who the artists were and who the interesting characters were around mm -hmm. town. And uh, that, that was a wonderful education for me. And uh, also through him, um, let's see now. Well, I'm, uh, uh, I had already known this guy, Buzzy, that I came out here with. And, uh, and they all introduced me to people like Neil Hefty and Gene Rowland and uh, 
Moondog and Larry Rivers was a tenor player there instead of a, then instead of a painter, and a whole world of of uh, jam sessions, Zoot Sims and Brew Moore and. Uh, uh, and people that were just around playing wherever there was a loft or a rehearsal studio yeah. or someplace like that to play. And um, the first summer that I was here, uh, Buzzy got a job with Gene Rowland up in Tupper Lake, New York. You may know where that sure is. Sure do. A place called the Altamont Hotel. It mm -hmm. burned down later, but it was a nice old hotel. And it was far enough out of the real Borscht Belt kind of entertainment that they didn't have a, a, a set agenda for what an entertaining band should be. So Gene had talked them into a quartet. He went up there with a drum, a tenor, piano, uh, and a, maybe a saxophone player, I'm not sure. But anyway, Buzzy was his drummer. And the first night that they were on the job, they were going to go up for the summer in 1950. The first night on the job, Gene has a big fight with the boss's wife and stalks out, oh. abandons the band. So Buzzy goes to the boss and says, look, there's no reason why you should be stuck without a band. Let me go to New York and get you some guys. Uh, he didn't particularly like the other guys, I guess, that Gene had hired. Mm -hmm. So he became the band leader. He came back and uh, he hired Freddie Greenwell, a wonderful tenor player who had been living in Seattle for mm -hmm. a long time, uh, and a trumpet player named Marty Bell, who's still around in Florida someplace and a piano player named John Benson Brooks, who had been the arranger for Randy Brooks's band when Buzzy was on that band. Buzzy Bridgeford was his name. And uh, he couldn't, couldn't hire a bass player. The, the boss wouldn't go for another rhythm instrument. So he goes back up with his quartet, and he tells me when he leaves, he said, look, uh, we're going to be up there all summer. Uh, if, uh, if things get to be a drag in, tune in New York, why don't you hitchhike up and I'll put you up for a weekend, you'll have a nice vacation in the mountains. And so uh, I did that. Uh, actually, they had, they had decided to hire another a singer and MC to go up, and the two of us hitchhiked up there together on the 4th of July oh. weekend. I think it took us something like 25 hours to hitchhike. <laughs> Nobody was picking up any two guys with instrument cases. So I get up there and sat in with the band and faked some three-part harmony with the tenor mm -hmm. and the trumpet. And Buzzy goes over to the boss and says, um, how do you like the way the band sounds? Nice and full, right? You know, the boss says, yeah, I guess so. He says, you know, this trombone player is very much in demand in New York, but his doctor found a spot on his lung and he's going to have to stay up in the mountains for a while. I think maybe if you made him an offer, you could get him, you know? So the <laughs> boss says, um, Offer him 15 bucks a week and room and board, see how that grabs it, you know? Uh, it was manna from heaven for me. So, <laughs> so I stayed there for the summer, and of course the third day I was on the job, I come to work and there's a string bass on the stand. And I said to Buzzy, did you hire a bass player? And he says, no, he says, I can't stand playing without a bass, so I rented this from a kid that owns one, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, I don't know, he gave him 10 bucks for the summer or something like mm -hmm. that, you know? And he says, whoever isn't playing has to play the bass. I can't stand this. So they gaslighted me into being the bass player. Uh -huh. Freddie wasn't interested in it. And, uh, and uh, I didn't mind it. I kind of, uh, it was kind of an interesting problem, you know. And they would, they would take me upstairs and play me records of Walter Page. Listen to what he's doing with Count Basie. Yeah. You know? Or uh, Ray Brown. Listen to what he's doing, you know. Listen, try to get that long sound. They had nothing to tell me about how to do any of this. Wow. It was just, this is what we want to hear, you know, which was wonderful. I figured out my own fingering system, mm -hmm. and uh, the piano player would get together with me every day and teach me chords, and uh, they would tape record the thing or wire record it. I can't remember what kind of a recorder the tenor player had, and they would play me little sections where I actually sounded good, you know, and say, no, that, that's what you're... So by the end of the summer, I had found my way around on the thing and, uh, and was able to play well enough mm -hmm. to get by. And when I came back to New York, I would go down to Charlie's Tavern looking for work, and nobody wanted a valve trombone player, oh. but occasionally somebody needed a bass player for Saturday night. Of course, I didn't have a bass, yeah. but uh, in those days, I could run over to 6th Avenue to Noel Wolf's string shop and uh, rent an old beat-up bass that he had there. He would charge $5 for the weekend. And then I'd run down the street to Jack Silver's tuxedo shop and oh. rent a, a jacket or a, or a tux for another $5. 
and the job paid 15 on which I, uh, the profit of $5, I could live for a week. You know? Oh, Lord. That's great. <laughs> There's a lot of eating at Horn and Hard Arts. And yeah. Well, my room on 8th Avenue and 52nd Street was, uh, the first room I had was $8 a week. And then when I found this drummer that was going to the Art Students League, he found a spot up, up in the 80s that was $12 a week that we could split, you know, so. <laughs> you saved two, huh? It was okay, well, you know. Well, that's great. That's some major scuffling. Yeah. Um, when, did the, when did you first start to do some writing for? Well, I had done writing uh, uh, just as a, as a writing exercise all through school and college. One of the best, best uh, college courses I ever took was a creative writing class where the woman gave us a lot of freedom, just showed us how to research and gave, gave us a lot of freedom to, to write whatever we wanted. And uh, somewhere, uh, I think after I started working for Stan Getz in about 1953, in there someplace, I had been through, uh, let's see, Teddy Charles, I think, was my first uh, really jazz group. I worked with his trio, and he taught me all my bebop changes. Mm -hmm. And then Jimmy Rainey came to work for him when Stan Getz wasn't working. He had been Stan's regular guitar player. And he took me on to Stan's band. And right around that time, I met a couple of writers for Downbeat. Uh, Nat Hentoff, I think, was still living in Boston and had started writing for Downbeat. And, um, and just in chatting with these guys, uh, uh, they realized that I could express myself clearly when talking about music, so they would come and ask me what I thought about different things. Mm -hmm. and, and eventually somebody asked me to do an article for Downbeat, and I did that. And um, then years later, when I was, I think I was with Jerry Mulligan by then, uh, Nat Hantoff and uh, Martin Williams and uh, a guy named Sho Wen Shi, Chinese man, uh, started a magazine called the Jazz Review. Only lasted a couple of years, but their idea was to get musicians to write reviews. They thought they could uh -huh. get it closer to the horse's mouth. Yeah. So they asked me, and I think the people who agreed to write reviews were me, uh, Cannonball Adderley, Bill Evans, uh, oh, gee, I can't remember now. They, they had a, quite a stable of guys didn't pay you anything. They just give you the records, and you would. No. Oh. Uh, th that way, our our opinions remain pure, I believe. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it was a good exercise. It made me really think what I thought about the music and try to say it clearly. You know, uh, I finally decided I didn't like writing music reviews because there was really a conflict of interest as a professional. You know that that. Um, even if you even if you use the most careful terms, you could be wounding a colleague's yeah. career. Yeah. And uh, uh, I just I got uncomfortable with it just about the time that the that the magazine died. I still do occasional book reviews when, uh, for the union paper. Uh -huh. They need somebody to do that once in a while. Right. And I don't I don't really consider myself a professional writer, and mm -hmm. I'm not going to get in anybody's way by saying what I think about some, uh, something uh, that I review there. But I don't really like reviewing music okay. anymore. This time, what, this was what year about? <coughs> the Jazz Review? Was, that yeah. was in the 50s. Oh. You know, I've lost track of that completely. Late 50s, early okay. 60s, I would imagine. Is this about the time yeah. you mentioned you saw um, the Basie band come into Oh, that Birdland. was uh, earlier. I, uh, you know, I became a denizen of Birdland as soon as mm -hmm. I got to town. Uh, that was the one place that was available to me. I, that's why I rented that first room a block away on mm -hmm. 8th Avenue. I'd go down there every night because I didn't have much of any place else to go. And uh, I think the admission was less than a dollar then. And you could go down and sit in the bleachers and you didn't have to spend another nickel and you could listen to Charlie Parker. Wow. You know? He was there with his own band for the first two, three weeks I was in town. And then it was, a, and the house band was just as strong. It was all guys that had worked with Bird, uh, Hank Jones and uh, Miles. Uh, I think Red Rodney was with Bird at that time, but Miles was in the house band. Mm -hmm. 
J.J. Johnson was in the house band. Max Roach was in the house band. It was uh, Amazing. wonderful. And then everybody would come by and play or come by and listen. I got to know what all the musicians looked like. Anyway, Lester Young would be in the house, and Art Tatum came in, sat in one night, and uh, uh, that's the first place I saw Joe Jones live. So um, it was someplace in the early 50s there that Birdland decided to um, Rede uh, remodel and redecorate. They added some acoustical tiles and stuff like that so that they could put Basie in there once in a while. Uh, this, this was a new idea to put a big band in a small club like that. Yeah. I guess it had been done on the street before, but not while I was around. <laughs> um, so uh, Basie had been working with, uh, with a small group just for economic reasons. Right. And I think this was right at the time that he put the new band together. His managers uh, talked to Birdland. Well, I guess his managers were connected with Birdland in some kind of way. There was a whole uh, small-time mob relationship <laughs> there, I believe. But Morris Levy was known known as uh, a, as a wise guy, and his brother, who later got knifed in Birdland, uh, was a was it just a little like a street punk, you know, that mm -hmm. uh, everybody knew was mob connected. But uh, uh, they put the Basie band in there. Uh, I, think, I think the deal was that since it was in town and they would guarantee them something like three or four appearances a year, that they didn't have to pay them their road salary. You know, they would, and they would get the band at a bargain rate that way. So here comes the band. Uh, I was working with Terry Gibbs's quartet about that time, so that must have been 52 or early 53 because I went with Thornhill. No, no, I was with Thornhill in 53 and then I went with Terry. That's what it was. So it was 53. Um, uh, we had this uh, two-week booking opposite the Basie Band. I think it was the first time that they had Count in there. And uh, See, Eddie Jones was the bass player, Gus Johnson was the drummer, Renald Jones was playing lead trumpet, Joe Newman was with them, uh, Frank West and Frank Foster, they featured them on a number called Two Franks, and uh, uh, Benny Powell was in the trombone section, uh, Wendell Cully, I think, was. Uh, Thad Jones hadn't come on the band mm -hmm. yet, it was just... Uh, I can't remember now whether Joe Wilder was there or not. I know there was a lot of changing around that went on during the from time to time. The band Marshall would come Royal back, was he on? Marshall was yeah. the section leader, yeah. right? And, uh, and Charlie Folks was the, uh, the baritone player, and Freddie Green, of course, was there. Uh, and uh, uh, I can't remember now whether it was that time. Or the next time that he came in, that that Joe Williams was with him. It seems to me that he didn't have a singer that first time when we were opposite them, because it seems to me uh, uh, I, I seem to remember my wife being there. She wasn't my wife at that time, but um, a girl I'd started to go with was the camera girl at Birdland, and I, at that time I was at the Hickory House with Marion McPartland. And I used to go over there, and I remember us standing together listening to Joe Williams, and I think it was the first time uh -huh. I'd heard him. Uh, so I think that was the, the, probably the second or third time that the, that the band came through. But I was thrilled with that band. I couldn't believe how good they sounded. And, uh, and we, we would just sit there every night between sets and listen to them play. It was an ideal learning situation. What was it about that <coughs> rhythm section that made it so uh, well, identifiable. Well, um, by that time, of course, I had, uh, I had memorized the Basie records. That was one of the things Buzzy did for me when I first met him in Seattle, was he said, you know, you don't know about the Count Basie records. <laughs> he got out all the, especially the old Deccas with Lester on right. them and played me all of those things. And uh, uh, he listened to me play drums a couple of times when I was at jam sessions and things. and. and he liked the way I play well enough to send me in to sub for him because he knew I didn't play as well as he did and I couldn't take the couldn't job take away from him. <laughs> but uh, he sat me down one day in his room and he said, what do you think about when you play the drums, you know? And I said, well, I think about, you know, putting the beats in the right place and uh, 
not speeding up and not slowing down. That seemed to be the big, the big issue with the rest of the band. He said, yeah, but what about swinging? You know, and I said, well, I don't really know what that means. I've heard that term, but I don't really know what that means. And uh, I couldn't have asked a better guy because he was the one person I've ever met in my life that was able to, sh to, to describe it. He, he put on some really swinging records. I remember there was a, a V-disc he had of Duke playing Jumpin' Pumpkins that was a much better take than the one that they released oh. on Victor. And, uh, and three or four, uh, like, you know, Pound Cake and, uh, uh, from the Basie Band and, and uh, Avenue C and some of those things. And he got up and danced out the swing and showed me, now, look what the drummer's doing here, you know, look what happens here, look what the band did there, look what this arrangement causes to happen, look what the soloist did there. Uh -huh all in rhythmic terms and I just it was like the scales fell from my eyes I saw immediately what he was talking about and from then on I had some kind of a an ideal rhythmically to, mm -hmm. uh, to try to shoot for you know so that was uh, when I got to hear this version of the Basie band um, I thought I thought Gus Johnson was was ideal because he was doing the same kind of thing in the rhythm section Gus had an interesting style of um, playing his cymbal beat was kind of like up on the on the top of the beat mm -hmm. uh, and it wasn't uh, wasn't a loose uh, you know the uh, the way the way the time is divided uh, uh, in swing uh, each of the four beats has a kind of a triplet division rather than a you know rock yeah. divides it by two right. jazz divides it by three and that quality that uh, Joe Jones had kind of established of that ching, 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 there's like a loose uh, pattern that he always played that you heard behind everything. Gus's was a little more ding, ding, ta ding, ding, ta ding. It was a little, the, 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 the triplet was pushed up a little <laughs> far. But when he would play a figure around the drums, it would be laid back. It would be, be almost behind the beat, you know. And the combination of those two, it kept the time up where it belonged, so he was right on Freddie mm -hmm. Green's time. And at the same time, he, he encouraged that loose phrasing uh -huh. that the band had. I thought he was the ideal drummer. I was very disappointed when they replaced him with Sonny Payne, mm -hmm. although I could see why they did it. Sonny was a showman, but I didn't think that uh, to sacrifice the heartbeat of that band yeah. to a showman was the yeah. right, right move. Uh -huh. Uh, commercially, I guess it was a very good move. Uh, Basie took his his manager's advice about yeah. it, you know. There's but I, I tell you, I liked Gus so much that um, years later, when uh, neither Mel Lewis or Dave Bailey were available for a Jerry Mulligan quartet job, and Jerry asked us for recommendations, I said, I know Gus Johnson's not doing anything right now, and I talked him into hiring him, and he stayed with us for about a year. I thought he was a wonderful addition yeah. to that group. And Joe's hit, uh, he, he had that hit every day. Oh, yeah. It was that, about yeah. that time, wasn't well, it? Well, when he came, the first time he came through with the band, he had, I think, maybe four really strong arrangements. He had every day, uh, he had in the evening when the sun goes down, uh, he had uh, the comeback, and I can't remember what else. I know Frank Foster had done something for him and Ernie Wilkins had done something for him. Uh, and they were just ideal arrangements. They, they, uh, Ernie, Ernie had that, uh, that understanding of the old uh, 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 riff patterns that grew up in the old Basie band and he was able to write new stuff that, that called up that rhythmic quality and that, uh, that together, mm -hmm. togetherness quality. Guys would play his his arrangements and it was like they'd always known them, you know. They'd yeah. Like, I remember that, that album that he did for Joe Turner uh, has those kind of arrangements, the Boss of the Blues album. Wonderful. It's just uh, uh, the uh, out of the blues tradition, uh, a, a tremendous organization of, of uh, forms that everybody has known forever, you know. And, it's and, a, and a real skill to be able to write something that comes from really that was just played from the top of your head yeah. to try to put that on paper. Yeah, oh yeah. So uh, Joe was very, very well supported by those arrangements. They really, and, and he knew what to do with them. He had an instrument and and uh, an ability to sing. And actually he was kind of bugged about getting locked into the 
image of being a blues singer mm -hmm. because he wanted to be a ballad singer and he knew he could do it and he felt that um, that he had come into the uh, the world of, of being a singer kind of on the tail end of the time when those kind of singers were easily promoted and mm -hmm. sold to the general public so you know, he was glad to have the gig with a major band but he really hated the fact that uh, all he got to do was these three or four blues charts that, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that Basie had for him. And Basie could see what an impact he was having on the audience, you know, he was, I mean, um, and it was only about his voice because at that time he had no stage presence at all. You know, he had a bad haircut, it was shaved way up to the top of his head and he had a jacket that was too short for him and he would just come out and hold his hands like this and close his eyes and sing and uh, made very little <laughs> eye contact with the audience, yeah. you know. And, but I mean, it was dynamite, you know. Everybody would just fall all over themselves and, <laughs> and so he became a star immediately, you know. Yeah. And it wasn't too long that uh, he loosened up yeah, and started to play with the audience. Now. <laughs> and he got a better tailor and <laughs> a better <laughs> barber. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, by the time uh, that band had been coming through there for a couple of three years, uh, Joe had really turned into a man. Well, it was very much like what happened to Tony Bennett. The first time I heard Tony, uh, I was over at Jack Siegel's house, a songwriter that mm -hmm. wrote uh, uh, When Sunny Gets Blue and Scarlet Ribbons and some of those songs. And Jack was, uh, was busy in the, in the Brill Building world. He knew he knew people and he knew songwriters. He was always good for a, for a dinner and, and a loan of five dollars if I would go over there <laughs> scuffling, you know. So, and he was a nice guy and, and we always had parties at his house and we would do things like sit around and reading Clifford Odette's plays and, uh, uh, or, or singing or it was very, very entertainment oriented uh, uh, happening over at his house. And at one time I was over there and um, this guy brings Tony Bennett by. I said, you know, I want you to hear this young singer I got and see what you think. And uh, he was kind of a straight, uh, not jazz oriented singer at all, not even, uh, not even pop jazz oriented. He was singing a song, like an Eddie Fisher uh -huh. type of singer. And he sang a little flat on his high notes and uh, uh, it was like singing out full, you know, like uh, out of the out of the Milanese uh, pop pop song song style, almost operatic, mm -hmm. you know. Except that you didn't make those operatic noises yeah. that, that opera singers do. Um, and the next thing we knew, somebody had uh, uh, gotten him a uh, well. It was Mob Connections. They had gotten him a, uh, a, a record a record contract with Columbia and they gave Mitch Miller the job of mm -hmm. promoting him. And Mitch realized that he had a, an ing interesting anguished sound in his upper register, so he deliberately put him a key or two higher <laughs> than he really was comfortable singing, uh -huh. and then he'd have him do eight or ten takes till he really sounded like he was dying, <laughs> and there were songs about mama and love and all of that. And he gave it an emotional quality uh -huh. that, uh, that Mitch knew was marketable. So he got popular enough that, uh, and you know, Tony was a, a darling guy, just a really, everybody liked him, he was such a nice man, and kind of innocent. And um, I just heard this on the grapevine, I never really discussed it with Tony, but uh, I heard that, uh, uh, that he, bought out, he bought his contract away from these, these guys that originally backed him, uh, and they charged him a, a nice, taste, but they were willing to let him go because he was a nice guy. Mm. You know? And uh, and then then uh, I think it was either hearing the Basie band or getting a chance to work opposite the Basie band, he realized that that was the kind of background he would like to hear behind yeah. him. He liked to, and also the first time that he got out with a, a supper club audience, uh, he fell in love with audiences. It turns out that he... Uh, had this ability to really relate to people in a very personal way as a performer. And it just changed him completely. He became an entirely different mm -hmm. singer than he ever had been before. So uh, uh, he, jazz had a very good influence yeah. on him. I think he Basie made some marvelous records with, with Basie, yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me ask you about this, um, this book. <laughs> uh, 
what prompted you to, to well, get into this idea of trying to, this is a mammoth project. Yeah, I tell you, the, uh, I've always loved musician stories mm -hmm. and uh, uh, it's been one of the nicest things about hanging out with musicians is that they're, uh, they remember even uh, adversity in, in numerous terms uh, uh -huh. after the original pain is over. Yeah. And uh, I used to love to sit around and listen to Roy Eldridge tell stories and uh, um, Hot Lips Page and people like that. Uh, it would just knock me out to, that there was such a slice of life there. Mm -hmm. that they, the, and, and usually it was a funny story about somebody else. You know, you could, you could rag on somebody a right. little bit to tell about their foibles or weaknesses or some, some time that they were taken for a fool or whatever. So... <coughs> I can't, I can't imagine how many times I've heard during one of these story sessions somebody say, boy, somebody should write these down. These are great. <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah. So um, about the time I got involved in Local 802, the, the New York Musicians Union, um, the new president, we all got swept in on a, on a, like a clean slate mm -hmm. uh, thing. We got tired of what the old administration yeah. was doing. and. John Glazel said, by golly, if I can't get somebody else to run for president, I'll do it myself. And how many of you guys are willing to be on the board? You know, so um, it did, uh, only the top four officers had to, had to give up their musical careers in order to be uh, union officials. So I didn't mind being on the board uh -huh. and I was willing to run for office. And we, we were surprised that we all got elected and none of the old administration wow. was, was left in at all. So. Uh, there was a monthly newspaper that the uh, union published and John was looking for material for it and he said, how'd you like to write a column? And I said, yes, I would and I know exactly the column I'd like to write. I uh -huh. want to start putting some of these musician stories in there. So the first uh, six months, I guess, I just wrote stuff that I remembered people having told mm -hmm. me or things that had happened to me personally. and. Um, it got so popular among the musicians, they started sending me stuff. And I've never run out of material. I've been doing it for something like 12 years now. And I still, uh, every time I put together my month's column, I look and that I see it. I still have enough for another column in my computer. Uh -huh. And by the time I get around to the next month, I've gathered enough other things that I've still, I've never had to, to reach back or, or hurry and interview somebody or anything like that. It's just been a natural thing. Yeah. So, um, well, I really got started writing again uh, in the 80s there someplace. Uh, I knew Gene Lees, who had been uh, the editor of Downbeat for quite a while and uh, uh, in one of his past lives. And during, during that period, I'd gotten to know him because he was hanging around uh, Jim and Andy's in, in New York a lot and got to know a lot of the musicians. And he was also a songwriter. Um, and he had ended up out in California and was publishing uh, a little article called, uh, uh, like a, a monthly newsletter called the Jazz Letter. And I can't remember, he'd been doing this for a couple of years before I heard about it. Uh, somebody sent me a, a, a gift subscription, I guess it was. And I was so pleased with it that uh, he had, you know, stuff that he wrote and stuff that other people wrote that he would put in there. So I wrote him a letter and said, do you have any back issues available? And he sends me a gift of all of the back I issues for the last two years. And uh, also a letter that said, uh, I remember when you came back from the Russian tour with Benny Goodman in the, f in the, uh, in the 60s there, uh, that you told a lot of funny stories about how, uh, what a catastrophe that trip was. Uh -huh. And uh, what would you think about uh, doing an article for Jazz Letter? You know, he said, I can't pay you anything, but you can, you can tell it the way it was, uh -huh. and I promise not to edit it, you know. So uh, I got to thinking about it and thought it would be fun to do, and I figured when I started it, it would just be recollections. I could do it in maybe 2,000 words, and uh, that would be that. <laughs> but as I started, Getting back into it, then I started calling up guys that were on the band that were still around, uh -huh. Phil Woods and Jerry Dodgen and uh, different guys. Joe, Wild I was working with Joe Wilder at that time, and Wayne Andre and uh, and Jimmy Maxwell, and so uh, we 
we reconstructed the thing, and I got more and more material, and uh, it ended up being quite a long essay. Uh, Gene published it in about four different issues of Jazz Letter. And that got me back into the business of not just writing, but of trying to write well, and, uh, and which, uh, which for me means writing it down and then going back and editing, editing it about 400 times until yeah. you get it said. Yeah. You know, get the sentences to really say what you want them to say, and and get out uh, the ambiguities out of there, and try to get the organization of the thing so that it goes somewhere. And uh, when it was all over, um, I was uh, I was still doing the column and, uh, and stuff like that. And uh, 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 I guess Sheldon Meyer, one of the, the one of the um, the heads of the New York. Uh, Oxford University Press uh, division is a jazz fan and uh, had been instrumental in getting a number of autobiographies published there. And Gene was one of his writers, and Dick Sudhalter was one of his writers. And so when he asked these, I guess Oxford had done some other anecdotes collections, one from the theater, one uh -huh. from literature, one from the opera, one from the military, something like that. So uh, uh, Sheldon was all hot on the idea of doing a, a jazz anecdotes collection. And he asked his writers, who would you recommend to edit this? And they both pointed at me. Uh -huh. So he called me up, and I sent him a bunch of my back columns. And he said, oh, yes, you're exactly the person we want. Let's make a deal. So uh -huh. we did. And then it took me about two years. Yeah, to, I can imagine. I had to, you know, I started with my own stuff. Then uh, I went to the Lincoln Center Library and read every jazz book they had. And then I started seeing references to books that they didn't have. And uh, so I called up Dan Morgenstern over at the Institute mm -hmm. of Jazz Studies, and he said, oh, yeah, we've got all that stuff here. So about once or twice a week for the next year, I would go over there and read all the books that they had. And, uh, and I discovered the oral history collection there. I went through that and I extracted every story that I could find. Wow. And uh, fortunately, the, my son had gotten me interested in having a computer in the house. Yeah. I had an old Radio Shack Model <laughs> 1. It was like a Model A Ford. <laughs> and uh, uh, so I upgraded it to disk drives and upper and lower case and stuff like that. And that was the machine that I mm -hmm. wrote this book wow. on. So uh, I was able to. Uh, uh, to do all of that editing mm -hmm. and rearranging and keeping track of sources and all that stuff. Uh, uh, I think it would have driven us out of the house if I had to do that on paper and yeah. file cards yeah. and stuff. And so I got it written, and Sheldon was very helpful in some suggestions about organizing the book. And um, once they accepted the final draft of it, then it took me another six months to get permissions to use all yeah. of the quite an extensive Sources, list of you know. acknowledgments. Yes. Yeah, so I wrote all these letters, and sometimes it would turn out that the publisher of an out-of-print book, had, the, the rights had transferred to three or four other locations. In one case, I never did find who owned it. They couldn't. It was just one of those things. I figured, mm -hmm. well, it's out there. And if somebody finally does write and, and claim a, a, a permissions payment, I'll be glad to give it to them. But I just can't find this one. Yeah. You know, so. But I did. I tied all the rest of them down and, and got the permissions letters and all yeah. of that. Wow. So when does volume two come out? <laughs> well, when I was putting together this volume, uh, I decided that my own, the stories from my own experience had a little different color to them. Mm -hmm. So I saved them all out just on a oh. hunch. And uh, when this was successful, I said to Sheldon, you know, I got another book. I said, this one's more of an, uh, an autobiography, but right. it's but it's stories, you know. And he said, OK. And so I wrote uh, From Birdland to Broadway. That was my second one. Yeah. And uh, uh, I don't really want to do son of jazz anecdotes. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I, I told the best ones in that book. Right. There's it would still be a hard lot of to. other stories around. And a lot of the ones that I do for my column are not particularly from the jazz world. They're musician stories yeah. from other venues. Yeah. And if I get some kind of a focus for that, I might try mm -hmm. making another book out of that. But right. uh, I, I am fooling around with some of the stories I couldn't tell for personal reasons, uh, people who are still alive. Yeah. Uh, but the, the stories are so good that 
I'm using them as uh, plots for uh, for short stories. I'm trying to teach myself to write fiction. Uh -huh. It's hard. It's, uh, I don't know if I'll ever get good enough at it to want to yeah. to bring it out in public. But uh, it's something that I play with at home. You know? Right. Well, you seem to keep pretty busy with oh yeah that yeah. and the the work in the local and and you still go around this area playing. Oh yeah, playing yeah. Bass. I play uh, at least uh, two nights a week, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes more. Um, I, I play a lot with Carmen Leggio mm -hmm. over in uh, Westchester, with Joe Shepley, he's got a, a steady Wednesday down in Yonkers, I play with him. And all the guys come by to play with us, so I get to play with George Young and Lou Delgado and guys like that. Mm -hmm. And um, some young players that Joe knows that uh, are coming along real good. And um, well, I took up the tuba while I was doing Broadway shows. I went back to a brass instrument mm -hmm. after 25 years of not mm -hmm. having touched one. Mm -hmm. And I found out I liked the tuba a lot. So uh, it, it relates very closely to the baritone horn. It's just a larger member of the same family. Mm -hmm. So uh, in order to keep my, my lip together on that, I go rehearse with the Rockland County Concert Band and sometimes the Saddle River Concert Band down mm -hmm. in New Jersey. And I do concerts with them when I can. And, and uh, during the summer, there's a, a lot of Dixieland work on tuba, uh, where, where my my knowledge of those old tunes comes yeah. in handy. And uh, once in a while, be, for for economic reasons, they they send out a group, like uh, to a store opening or a, 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 an auto opening or something like that, where they want a a kind of a Dixieland group, but they don't want to pay a full Dixieland band, so they'll send out maybe. Uh, drums, banjo, tuba, and clarinet. Uh -huh. or, or one time I did it with just banjo and tuba. And I love those jobs because I get to fill in all of the missing parts. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I can play the, the trombone parts and uh, get to take a lot more solos that way, you know, and it's really interesting to me. Wow. You must be tired by the time it's done, though. I <laughs> no, I, it's very refreshing. <laughs> Once great. in a while, if, if I haven't been playing much during that week and, and then do a four hour job that's yeah. A lot of playing. I'll, my lip will get tired, but right. um, it wakes me right up. Makes me feel like playing music. You know, mm -hmm. it's a, it's an interesting challenge. Great. Mm -hmm. Well, this has really been fascinating. <laughs> I, I Did don't you know, know if that you could... my books have been translated into Japanese. No kidding. And <laughs> well, that makes sense because Jap Japan is really a, that's the market. They, yeah. they love jazz over there, right? Well, this guy called me up. Uh, um, he's a He's a Japanese uh, writer himself. He's done short stories in, in Japanese. Mm -hmm. And he was studying up in Boston somewhere. And he's and fluent in English. He doesn't do his own English translations of his own stories, though someone else has mm -hmm. done those. But he told me that uh, uh, his publisher had made a deal with Oxford to, uh, to, uh, for him to do a translation in the Japanese. And he wanted to do an interview. So. Uh, uh, on the strength of that, I'm finally getting to do a record in my own name you know, from a Japanese Wonderful. record company that wants to Wonderful. tie it in with the book being released over there. So uh, I'm going to use the group that I play with here in, in Westchester, Carmen Leggio uh -huh. and uh, Joe Cohen, Al Cohen's son, a good guitar player, and a drummer named Dave Jones that we've been playing with. He's a very good drummer. So oh, that's great. <laughs> so we're doing that next month. Great. Well, on behalf of the college, I'd like to thank you for taking the time out to well, it's tell a pleasure. your story. Everybody likes to talk about themselves. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if, you know, I was going to say, pick one favorite story out of that, but that would be It's like saying pick so a favorite hard. tune, you know, yeah. I just, I yeah. really can't do that. Uh, yeah. uh, I, I always love the one I'm involved in at the moment. Right. You know? I'll give you a new story that's not in there. Uh, Gene Burton Sini was was chatting up a, a girl on the street while he was waiting for Bobby Shankin to come down the dr drummer. And uh, Gene's a very handsome guy and beautifully dressed usually, and very tidy. And when uh, he told her that he was a guitar player, she didn't believe him. She said, you don't look like a guitar player. And she's thinking of rock guitar yeah. players. So Bobby comes down and he says, Bobby, uh, would you explain to this young lady how I make my living? And Bobby says, well, he's one of the best jazz players in the world, and I have no idea how he makes his living. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. All right. Well, thanks for your time. Sure. It's been a real pleasure. Sure.
Jerry Mulligan Quartet. Bernard Farmer, Dave Bailey, Bill Crow, Jerry Mulligan. 